Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this 205 service to Bournemouth and Paul. I'm going to play a slow audio CD that will give you all the information you need while travelling on this coach. And when I've done that, I will dim the lights for your comfort. Thank you for listening. Welcome to National Express. A customer information card is located in the seat back in front of you. Please take a moment to familiarize yourself with its contents. You are required by law to always wear the seat belts that are provided on this vehicle. Smoking and consuming alcohol is not permitted at any time anywhere on this coach. For your safety, CCTV recordings may be made during this journey. Emergency exits are located at the front and rear of this vehicle and are clearly marked.
We end up talking about working more in relation to environmental conservation. Environmental conservation is one of the three pillars of sustainable development, so there is a link. If you look at the way how UN has been focusing on these areas since 2008 and also uh, after the Rio Plus 20 conference, they are giving more focus on the green economy concept, which also links these two aspects very, very closely. So this conference is going to explore all those aspects and uh, inviting you to present your research in these areas. We have post-conference publications, uh, forthcoming book on tourism in the green economy, and also a special issue in the tourism management perspectives general. So there are several ways we all can work together in this area in future as well. In terms of housekeeping announcements, all the keynote uh, presentations will be delivered in this room whereas the individual papers will be presented at the lecture theaters outside. Uh, there are two uh, in the ground floor and one upstairs. Coffees, lunches, teas will be served in the room where you had your coffee this morning. I hope you enjoyed the conference. If you have any questions, you are most welcome to speak to a member of the Bournemouth University or the registration desk uh, at the front. Thank you very much for attending. I will now hand you over to my dean, Dr. Keith Wills, and our co-vice chancellor. Thank you, Jake. Welcome, everybody. Well, my role today is obviously to welcome you and uh, thank you for some very good weather with you. Clear blue skies. And you've also come at the same time as the whole pedestrian area of the university has been opened up, so we've a good start for the day. I think, in terms of the conference, I think some of you will remember the conference we had two years ago, which I think both BJ and I enjoyed immensely. Uh, BJ instantly wanted to have a conference. He said, no, wait a little bit, BJ. And then he wanted a four day conference, and he said, no, two days will be sufficient. But, uh, He's been working very hard for the last few months organising this conference. I think thanks to BJ, 
there was an Aaron in the team elsewhere as well, so we were going to get this up and running. I think in terms of uh, the conference theme, obviously it's the relationship between climate change and tourism, and tourism and climate change. I think one of the attractions of the previous event was the multidisciplinary nature of the speakers and the papers. Uh, as a geographer, listening to various presentations about the subject was very interesting for me. But in a sense, I think it's the nature of the subject. It's got to be multidisciplinary. I think any discipline claiming to be the sole uh, area of wisdom is probably struggling in a sense. I think one of the things I'd like to raise in a sense is that uh, truly international, we have more than 20 countries represented in the room today. I think clearly climate change and tourism has varying impacts depending on where you are globally. And I think that's something we need to think about as we go through the conference. The key message is that uh, climate is, is a key resource for tourists, but it also contributes to climate change. We've done a seven of the CO2 emissions in uh, 2008, with a baseline year 2005. And one of those is for people to see. I work together with a, a group of scientists. This does not take into account the radiative effect. Uh, the, why? Because there is no consensus on the amount of the percentage that the radiative effect can have. So we prefer to use only the CO2 emission, which is 5%. Uh, other messages, uh, you know, uh, tourism is an economic sector, contribute to the Millennium Development Goals. And uh, we, uh, then we, uh, let's say we, is in WTO, but also all the other agencies that participate of the conference and the message on the need of mitigating emissions, uh, the need to adapt both at business and destination level, the need to develop new technologies and the need to support poorer countries and regions to um, have their adaptation uh, um, projects and policies. Big data, we're going to analyze it in a different way, put <coughs> together a, uh, a group of other scientists and they call themselves the Berkeley Earth Surface Temperature, the best, they call it the best temperature reconstruction, and we're going to, we're going to do our own analysis of the, of the record. And uh, we're then going to compare what they then said, and we'll compare it to the NASA GIST record, the Goddard Institute for Space Studies record, the, uh, the, uh, the American NOAA record, and the Hadley Center Climatic Research Unit had crude data, data set. And then we'll show, that actually, that the, these, these, these groups, these modeling groups, haven't done this, the instrumental record, haven't, haven't reconstructed it properly. Uh, and of course, lo and behold, what happens is that the best, the best temperature record shows exactly the same pattern as all the other temperature records. And this came out last year. And Richard Muller then, a uh, bit like sort of uh, road to Damascus conversion, said, we are seeing substantial global warming. And none of the effects raised by the skeptics, and he was one of them, is going to have anything more than a marginal effect on the amount of global warming. So I think now this is a very interesting and very clear test of the instrumental record. It's quite clear that warming is happening. And even when uh, a well-known skeptic like uh, Richard Muller uh, under, under weight. And as Dr. Fletcher said earlier, the older we get, the more cynical we get. Um, so this presentation, I guess, is wrapped around the question why, as well as which, uh, which appears in the title. Um, I was trained as a geographer. Much the best subject from which to study tourism, because tourism deals with movement from place to place, and also humankind's reaction with the natural world. It also, and I think this is a key point with tourism, uh, with a geographical background, it gives you at least some uh, basic science, or it used to, uh, when I was being trained anyway. I think one of the biggest tragedies of, of tourism research, as it's grown over the last 50 years that I've been involved with, it, is the almost, well, it is, minimal participation of physical scientists in anything to do with tourism. Um, it's, it's all very well said for saying he's not informed about tourism. I think generally tourism researchers are virtually totally ignorant of any aspect of natural science. And I think it's a disaster for where we're going. And I think it's partly why um, some of the questions I'm going to ask uh, get answered. So, um, Okay. How do we view? I, I know it's looking for a title that we've got some questions and the good and bad and the ugly is all right. Um, but you know, we tend to look at things very simply. I think part of the problems, part of the reasons that we haven't reacted well enough to the overwhelming evidence that Stefan and others have produced about climate change 
Um, it's partly because of our misconceptions, improper perceptions, inaccurate perceptions, and whatever, about the elements we're talking about. So tourism, is it bad, is it ugly, it's good, it's all of them. Sustainability, well, you know, it's not all pie, it's another word, it's bad if you do it. And climate change, clearly, in one sense, is bad. But the problem is it's also good, and we can argue that it's good if we want to, in certain other aspects. So it leaves us with this situation of difficulties, confusion, in definition, in understanding, in measurement. We don't like change. Um, humankind generally likes what we've got. We want minor improvements, we want personal improvements, but drastic change worries us, scares us, as we get older it does even more. Um, like trying to turn on the television. Uh, my car is 10 years old. I've never finished reading the instruction book yet. There's 47 pages on the radio. You know, that's scary compared to pushing a button and the sound comes up. Um, so I think generally we don't understand the full dimensions of tourism. I mean, I, think, I know I don't, and I've been going for 50 years in it. Um, we're ludicrous about sustainability, um, the difficulty of it, accepting the impossibility of sustainable tourism, um, far too little scientific knowledge to understand how complex climate change and its implications are, even at one hand of a drastically obvious and profound. Um, and therefore, the public at large, which we are not, I mean, we are not normal human beings. We're highly educated, we're biased in our viewpoint, we're trained in certain ways. We are not normal. Uh, and that makes it very difficult for us, I think. And so I'm being conceited here, pretending I can understand normal people, um, you know, as to why they react and have the perceptions they do. There's an article just come out in the last issue of Journal of Sustainable Tourism talking about how we get information um, in terms of climate change related risk and by implication of sustainability. 61% from the television. You know, how many of you as academics can while your, your students quoting things they've seen on television or they've read on the internet? But that's where most of the information comes from. Um, and that final conclusion is a bit devastating. In terms of climate change related risk to the travel of social and environmental issues are weakly perceived and don't appear to be influential. What the hell is the point? It's depressing. And so we get um, <laughs> ah, we don't have we don't have one of the illustrations here. The version here is not one of the illustrations. Well, I'll have this to I've got the I've got it on memory stick in the I my computer crashed when I was trying to install it in printer, and so being unable to send to DJ um, the, uh, the PowerPoint by the deadline, I ended up having to reconstitute slides from all other places because I couldn't get to my hard drive. Um, and so I sent a version which had the sort of textual PowerPoints, but I couldn't get the illustrations. So I sent the other one, I mean, Monday, but I think you've got them all out. Chair of our steering committee, of course, we don't have a Rainforest Alliance, OECD, and so on, so on, some other governments, and so on, some other governments. And our composition is, is basically <coughs> this in terms of the number of partners. We've grown from having 40 odd partners in 2011 to 90 odd partners in 2012, so it's a fairly rapid growth from a fairly beautiful organization. And, uh, and much of that is about 40% of NGOs and about 27% of governments. And the others distributed as in the case here. How we do our work or what we do our work, the intention is that we are promoting sustainability <coughs> and solutions through the project formula, of course. We network and we cooperate amongst partners, and this graph is indicated to show how we intend to do that. 
because we're uh, a program initiative of, of many UN agencies, it's important to continue to build capacity and to share knowledge and, and disseminate best practices, which is a, a, a core mission of, of UNEP. And of course, in, in settings like this and other settings, we advocate for this couple of improve sustainable, sustainable tourism policies. From the project standpoint, we, in terms of what we are focused on, we want to move away from the more single, isolated projects with limited impact to more scaled up versions of those projects which can actually serve the transforming nature of what we do. How, how we define tourism? Well, we don't have a, an independent uh, Definition: We accept what the UNWTO says. We make more judgments where that is concerned. It's, in, it's important to say, I think, that we have a and share the common language of sustainability. But we're most importantly focused on this, which has been very difficult to measure. And I don't know that we have it right yet. But we're still working on it. So we're looking at, at implementation as opposed to a type of, of tourism in terms of defining a specific type of tourism, like ecotourism, or whatever. We're looking more at implementation, how it is done. And, and to go back to this slide that uh, appeared earlier, in terms of success, from a global standpoint, from, from in, in terms of the, the way we are executing our mission, we're looking at three major things. There are other indications, obviously, and not, this is not an exhaustive list. But this is, these are the most important that we starting off. Diversity, as I was mentioning earlier, in terms of approach, we don't believe that any one strategy is going to achieve sustainability. But there really has to be, a, I think everything is valid. It's just a question of, of, of if it's valid at destination X or destination Y and, and how they are used in conjunction. And because <coughs> tourism is such a multifaceted, transversal uh, industry, not, no one team or one agency, be it national, regional, or global, has resources in terms of, of money, in terms of uh, capacity, in terms of human resources, and so on, to, to do everything. They, you really have to have multifunctional, multifaceted team, I think, to uh, address some of the complexities. An area that has been a little bit underserved in our, in our business is consumers, not from the standpoint of satisfying their needs and wants if you were a, a hotel, but in influencing their behaviors and, and giving them a greater choice. So, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of the work that the is doing, there's a greater focus on, on providing products and services, sustainable products and services, that we hope will influence the choices and the behaviors of the consumer side, so we're focused on that. And measuring, as a third indicator, you know, how well are the multiplicity of projects that we find and are still ongoing at the destinations, how well are they meeting the national objectives or the national priorities, be they uh, sustainable consumption, which is still a little bit uh, nebulous in, 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 in the eyes of some, in terms of poverty alleviation, in terms of national development, how are all of what the countries claim to be doing? Are they contributing to these goals? So these are some of the things that we are looking on. We are looking at in terms of, uh, of of determining whether or not the programs, the approaches, the activities that we are recommending are having the desired impact. Now this slide is not meant to test your reading skills, or, <laughs> you know, and uh, I have to apologize for it. Uh, I've challenged the team to try and find a better way of, of representing what we're trying to represent here. And I will describe it simply as that. Back in, in the early 2000s, um, UNEP, along with some of its other partner agencies, initiated what they call the Marrakesh process, where they looked at sustainable development generally across the board in terms of, of five task forces which were organized around specific themes, which, were, which range from sustainable tourism to sustainable lifestyles to sustainable buildings, etc. And they
Yesterday we started off with climate change and some of the science behind it, and I think that probably pretty well shocked us all. So today we're going to start and we're going to have two uh, really interesting presentations looking at the industry perspective. And I think as academics that's really important because often we forget about the industry side and that's really what we need, really need to consider. And so I think uh, it will be a really interesting presentation to get that balance between the science and the practice of what we're doing. So without further ado, ma'am, I'll hand over to you and we'll... I, I asked if we get any discounts because so I'm very curious. Yeah. She didn't. She didn't really answer me, so I don't know. So um. I said the question's asked about if you have friends and family discounts. There you go. There we go. So good questions, please, everyone. <laughs> Because <coughs> it all sounds great in words, but when I show you 
what it could look like, these illustrative figures. But currently, in 2005, um, which is the baseline year for these, we were at about 700 million tons of carbon dioxide emissions. This is our do nothing. If we do nothing, no new investment, existing technology, um, then we go potentially to big one. What we're committed to doing is to get, oops, let me go back to point two, which is why you probably can see why it's such a scary chart for the aviation sector. It's a very, very large reduction in our emissions that we're committed to. Um, the, this is a British Airways chart. So you went into, we're not just in nice areas, being cynical in the sense of looking for your customers, getting them in early. Um, I think there's implications for us about what our students are going to be like in 10 years' time, having mm -hmm. studied responsible, sustainable tourism at primary school. Um, anyway, so the schools program really interesting. I'd you know, be interested, perhaps outside of this, having a conversation on that. The question for you both, though, is um, I get an honest answer. How do you value the worth of academic research in tourism? and academic research more generally in your programs. And that I spoke to certainly, it was that snowmaking was was the be all and end all really to their strategies at the moment. There was one more hand up. Love, got time for one more. Do you have any question about the, the response to climate change during the views? In sort of mitigation. How do you respond to a climate change scenario or something like that? Do you mean like mitigation or ad adaptation? Like adaptation. Adaptation. Yeah. It's solely snowmaking. I mean that's their that's their strategy pretty much. I mean. There has been, um, there's a, a conglomerate of sorts, there's three ski fields, two in the Queensland Lakes region, one in Canterbury, and they, they're together under the banner of NZSki.com. Um, so they, they're solidifying their business and, and, you know, allowing themselves to, they, I spoke to the CEO of the organisation and he said, you know, it allows us to edge our bets a bit, if one has a bad season, we can help each other. But they're also the three ski fields that have the most snowmaking. So um, it, it really does seem to be focused on snowmaking at the moment. Yeah. What about the customers? Customers? I don't know. I don't think that their behaviours are really... I mean, certainly last year, was a, it was a very strange year to speak to them because everybody was starting to think a bit more about, well, this happened this year and the season's been cut short. What does this mean for the future? And that's definitely something that's starting to become a bit more ingrained in their consciousness. But, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, thank you. Thanks, challenge when it comes to decision making around um, zoning and, and guidance on issues of climate change. For example, at that time, many years ago, um, back in, well, not that many, five years ago, um, there was, councils didn't have the ability to draw a line on the map at any, at any level of, of um, resolution as to where sea level rise might come under various scenarios. So a bit, a little bit um, hampered, and I was quite frustrated um, by that concept. So first of all, thank you very much. The friends at uh, Bournemouth University, then the friends from different parts of the world, especially uh, nearly 30 country, the delegates, uh, the parts for the seminar, and I think it's an opportunity to uh, present my paper before all the, the delegates from across the, the world. And as far as my uh, the, uh, the subject is concerned, so it is all about sustainable <coughs> cultural adaptation of tourists. Uh, a case study of Aruvili, it's all about 
a place located in India. And we have international city in this particular place. And before we discuss about the details of this place, I would like to you know, describe something about my uh, the plan of the presentation. Outline is like this. So, the introduction, literature review, Aruveli, the place of study where uh, this research was conducted, the data and methodology, findings and discussions, conclusions, and finally, suggestions. So, this is a brief outline of my presentation, and it is a, a small a research paper, so conducted with the help of my PhD scholars who are working under my guidance. So if I look at uh, the introduction of my presentation, it is all about India, uh, Indian uh, the characteristics. From the tourism perspective, the India is uh, somewhat very uh, wonderful nation and we have the, the season for tourism throughout year from 365 days and 12 months you will find the tourists from across the world they visit India. India provides such an opportunity to see different parts. I will tell you the, uh, the uniqueness of the country. Uh, even if it is a hot summer you will find the southern part of India is very hot. When you look at the northern and northeast side India, it's very cold and uh, rainy season. So when it is uh, rainy season, you will find you know, some parts very hot, some part is very cool. And this type of uh, different, uh, you know, the climatic conditions are there in the country. And we have, you know, uh, the three sides, sea and one side, Himalayas. Then if I look at the, the cultural diversity that is there in India, as far as culture is concerned, India <coughs> is a wonderful place and you will find several cultures, especially from the states of 33. And you will find every state has its own the culture. And within the state, you will find in each and every part, you will find several cultures. All together, uh, as per the, the statistics are concerned, you will find more than 500 ethnic groups and several languages, culture, in terms of the food habits, in terms of their, uh, uh, you know, the dressing pattern, and then the, uh, you know, the rituals, and then uh, so they all sense you will find the several, uh, you know, the differences and the distinct uh, nature that is existing in the country. Then if you look at uh, the inbound tourists who are actually uh, coming from different parts and visiting the Indian various states, and we have. No, uh, the wonderful infrastructure to receive the inbound the tourists from different parts and then when they visit India and they need a kind of cultural adaptation in the sense they are supposed to understand the local culture for you know, more enjoyment and more uh, uh, you know, uh, the enlightenment in the particular the destination. And then uh, in that perspective, if you look at the country, it's a wide diversity of culture and whoever is visiting uh, the, the tourists from different parts, so what extent uh, they develop the adaptability of that local culture. So based on that, this uh, the study was uh, selected. <coughs> then uh, if I look at all questions, I read a book a few years ago about Pondi, because it was called in the book, called Heat and Dust by Ruth Pro Joel. Like, yeah, yep. <laughs> there's a controversy. And, and I was wondering whether people actually came to Pondi to, to see Osher, 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 whether people actually came as a result of, of that book. Uh, no, years. the book, book actually published in recent, uh, recent times mm -hmm. and just uh, last year it became a controversial Oh, did it? Yeah. So it's uh, no uh, something uh, the other side of uh, Aravinda life. Yes. The book was written uh, uh, on the other side of life, but we don't know what is fact. Yes. What is the reality? Nobody knows. knows. Mm -hmm. And but the other has written something about uh, Aravinda. It became controversial. It went to up to the government of India, the Home Ministry, and Home Ministry has given uh, the final uh, adjudication in favor of uh, the person. Right. So yeah. here. Uh, we respect the human rights and you have a freedom to write as a writer 
and uh, if any controversy, just you one can uh, know the challenge it with the you know, evidences and uh, the valid reasons. Mm -hmm. So that's there, and uh, that's not the uh, fact. But uh, since the Pondicherry uh, Aravind Ashram is an international uh, center, so we have the, the tourists throughout year from different parts, especially from European countries. Mm -hmm. European countries, we have always you know the tourists who are visiting this place. Mm -hmm. The reason I ask is because I've had it for quite a long time. It's sort of a yellowed old book, and and um, it really created an evocative image of Pondicherry. And I wondered whether people came there expecting exactly what was represented in the book, and and perhaps to have that close relationship there's, with the There is no any impact. Yeah, there is no any negative impact of this book for the the visitors and the people who are actually coming to this Pondicherry. There is no impact. It is just only a news item. The news, that's all. Okay. Thank you. I was just going to ask one thing, which was um, compared to other destinations, it's, some, it's a place that people go to for a period of time. We talked about two months. Yeah. So I just wondered what lessons could be learned for other destinations where typically people might go for a very short period of time. Um, you know, because I assume that the length of stay is quite important. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, uh, the, since this destination is something different, they, they, they just come for uh, spending more time, not for uh, the days. They stay there for months, at least two, three months, right? So they work in the ashram, and uh, so they join in the meditation center. Uh, after uh, you know, uh, spending you know, uh, sufficient time, so then they leave the place, right? So, uh, for that they have to you know, see the, because it is located in the village, not in the city, right? It's completely village and uh, away from the, the rural, it is completely rural place, not uh, urban uh, the city. It is completely rural. In and around you will find all the village public and uh, the village public, they have their own traditions and customs. The tourists who are visiting this are really uh, international city, internationally call it as village, so they always move with the local people. So they have to understand the local culture. Yeah. It's something uh, different, you know, uh, the place and uh, the different uh, uh, story. Yeah, well, the role, yeah, the role of similar kinds. Of yeah, and even uh, uh, at present you will find 40 country people are there. They're all living together in the same place. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I've been waiting for the, uh, the main man who's to come through the door. So, uh, thank you very much for attending this afternoon. Obviously, it's the final session. I know from experience at conferences in London when uh, tea and coffee are at 3.45, there's a mad rush for Waterloo Station straight afterwards. So, thank you very much for staying for a, a question and answer session this afternoon. A couple of things to start with. He's gone again. He's very resistant to getting any praise, DJ, but uh, now he's here and he's shut the door. He does deserve to get all the praise for running this conference, because despite his attempts, I've done very little. But equally, lots of help from various people, Jennifer here, Karen, Karen's here as well. So the staff in the school have been helping him as well, but he's been DJ driving it. Um, since the first day conference two years ago, he have been on and on about having another conference, as I said, on the opening session, four days, three days, eventually just the two. He's worked very hard for this in quite difficult times, so thank you very much, DJ. You can't reply this time. <laughs> Equally, just to sort of, I haven't asked any questions so far, because I knew at the end of the whole two days I've got an opportunity to ask any questions I like of the panel and anybody else, but I think one of the things I said right at the beginning is that this whole issue has to be multidisciplinary. It has to involve the various stakeholders we have here. Tourists, industry, academics, NGOs, and so on. And the notion that any one of those can solve or even get anywhere near to tackling the problem, I think, is naive. And as many of you know, I'm a very boring, pragmatic person, so I like a bit of realism to mm -hmm. as well. Now, I, one of the criteria we used for the last conference, which is why I have the second one, is that both PG and I enjoyed it. So any other merits, they're relevant. Now, I think we enjoyed this one, and I think the reason I've enjoyed it is I think, from my own personal perception, I'm an academic one, there's some very realistic papers. I thought Stephens yesterday on climate change, very hard to argue against there's something happening in the climate. But the industry papers, the NGO papers, give a very realistic picture of our industry that we're interested in. I also started yesterday with my facetious comments about my holiday in France, and I'm 
driving around in my car at high speed. Derek's in there, so I get lots of stick there. But that's what I did. And many of you take those holidays. We might sit here as academics and say, wouldn't it be nice if we did this, we did that? But we don't. The reason some of these businesses are in operation is because we don't. We fly. You know, many of you have flown all around the world to come to a conference. And part of what I would do, and if Derek nods again, I'll tell you about Strasbourg a couple of years ago in general laugh. So, so the realism has to be there. And I think, as several people said, if we stop doing things now, there's a whole time lag built into the system. And we are going to stop going on holiday. That's what Chewy thinks we would do. <laughs> and the realism has to be there. And I think that's what conferences like that should get across, that we have to be pragmatic. Those people haven't been on holiday before, maybe we'll want to go on holiday in the future. But we're not going to stop going on holiday either. So I think that realism is what I want the conference to have, I think it's delivered. The, the final session, we have a gang of six here to answer your questions. And I'll just get them to briefly introduce themselves for those who either weren't here yesterday or weren't here today. So that is a bit. Good afternoon, Luigi Gabrini from the World Tourist Organization. I'm responsible for a sustainable tourist program within the organization, which we see at the other side of, of the medal of uh, tourist growth, which we are supporting, especially for benefits of the development. Hello, everyone. My name is Madame Lucru, and I work with UNESCO, Sesquipedi Noman, and Vice Air Program. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pierre Fischelman. I'm from the United Nations Environment Program in Paris, and my responsibility is for the Global Partnership for Sustainable Tourism. And good afternoon. I'm Jane Ashton. I'm the Director of Sustainable Governance at Two Travel PLC, and uh, I guess my mission is to drive Two uh, Travel to become more sustainable. Thank you very much. Now, as I said, I have the opportunity to ask the first question, and it, it is partly tongue-in-cheek, partly serious, but I think Jane hinted this morning, the evidence that uh, the element of sustainability in green doesn't really bring in many customers. So my question is, how many customers, tourists, whatever that you deal with, are genuinely green to sustainable tourists whose decision-making and spending is based entirely on that? Roughly. Is that a large number or a small number? I think it's less than 1%. Yeah. That's, that's my pragmatic boring view. Some of my colleagues have grown there, but Anybody else wants to comment? Um, maybe those uh, green travelers are not good customers, but there are many. Um, as, uh, if you look at the tourism, uh, the structure of the tourism sector and the division of the different uh, kind of destinations and distances people travel, and the carbon footprint, that still more, more than half of them is below the average, and they are at least doing better than the average. But most customers. Are Tour operators tend to be in the other half, even less. That's about the average. So the, the, the real the tourist might be not as a tourist as uh, 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 your customer. Mm -hmm. I think you were saying it's their primary driver. Yeah. Wait, right. Jane, are you even seeing it in the smallest soft event? No. I wish it were otherwise. It were intelligent. Yeah. <laughs> The other comments before I throw it open. I think when the uh, stirring the question to start with, then I don't think anybody else will comment. Okay, over to Janet. Yeah. Um, sorry, I haven't got the microphone. I'll just come around a bit because it's probably too far away. Um, I was just going to say, how many people buy bridges on green criteria realistically? You know, because um, if you think about it, when um, the whole criteria for. Um, products in the home became these green standards. I don't think there was any green customer case and place to speak on. I think it was very low. So I'm not sure why the tourism industry sees itself as being different from other industries. And I suppose I'm throwing that back to the panel as well. I'll attempt a little of, of the of an answer to that question and hope it's adequate. Um, from my experience of, of working with, with industry and in, this, in the industry, it, 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 the rationale for making a decision as to whether or not you're buying uh, energy compliant or, if you like, green appliances is cost at the end of the day. 
And uh, whilst I think, especially in the region that I come from, which is the Caribbean, which is the one that I'm most familiar with at this point, uh, there, because there's a push for greater energy efficiency in the Caribbean right now, simply because of the cost of fuels, and in many of the countries, many of the islands, over 90% of their energy is still generated from fuels, from fossil fuels, and in some cases 100%. And because many of the countries have accepted the challenge to move towards a green economy or to foster sustainability mm -hmm. principles throughout the economy, the tourism sector is uh, an obvious target because it's, it's the biggest uh, income earner in many of the islands. And a lot of the hoteliers have accepted the prospect of becoming more sustainable in their operation, mm -hmm. including uh, availing themselves of the technologies that are out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, as long as they can finance or at least work the cost of the purchase of these appliances into their operations, into their plants, through their cash flow or with grants or, or, or loans, concessionary loans, they will do it. Mm -hmm. you know? But for them, it, first and foremost, it's a cost. Yeah. product, which is a high quality product, 
and uh, the sustainability contribute to the high quality of that product. Mm.